Of course, we've all heard of intellectual property. Cases like Kodak versus Polaroid and Samsung versus Apple. But what is intellectual property and how does it affect small business owners? I'm Lisa Smith and this is Focus on Business. We have Sarah Miller with us, Vice President of Strategic Communications for the Small Business Association of Michigan. And we are talking today about intellectual property. Sarah, things have changed as it relates to IP. Uh, there have been a whole new set of rules we need to be paying attention to. Exactly. I think one of the most common issues that, that we see is that there's so much information and content readily available on the internet that you think it might not be doing much harm to potentially go out to a search engine, look for a photo that would be great on your website, and post it. Harmless, right? Well, not necessarily because a photographer took that photo, it's their intellectual property, and that's not being very kind or even lawful to take it without permission or paying for it. So I think that just in general, making sure that business owners are being conscious about their um, use of others' intellectual property is certainly crucial, especially in this age of digital everything. Sure, and there's got to be some resources available for this, if you have some questions. Right, so we have resources to help our members with their own intellectual property as well, and to kind of understand the steps they need to take to make sure that they're protected. That could be anything from their logo, to a, a slogan, their brand, a product, a service, a trade secret. Um, business owners work really hard at what they're good at, and we want to make sure that they're protected as well. So we have some webinars on our website, as well as different resource articles that members can, or any small business really can come and take a look at to help them understand. And if that's too much work, we do have a hotline available. So if you're a premium or VIP member of SBAM, you can get free access to an attorney to kind of help you wade through some of these simple Q&As regarding intellectual property. Outstanding, thanks so much. We've got some great guests on the show today. Denise Polacella and Jackie Langwith, welcome today on the show. We're talking about intellectual property and it's one of those business terms that's sort of hiding in plain sight. You aren't gonna pay any attention to it until somebody steals something from you or maybe you get slapped by accidentally using something of somebody else's. But in today's environment in a digital world, it's an important thing to know if you're a small business owner. So Jackie, why don't you start and break down for us, what is intellectual property? Intellectual property is a product of the mind. It is um, something that you create. We all are creating intellectual property every day. There are three main types of intellectual property. There um, are copyrighted works. Those are um, things that you are, you're an author of. It would be a book, a novel, a music, a play, um, architecture or um, software. Then there are patents and those are um, inventions. That would be something that is a unique device, a machine, um, a process to do something, um, or a man-made chemical compound. The third category of intellectual property is trademark. That would be something that you use with your um, product that you offer to consumers or a service that you offer to consumers. These three main types of intellectual property are things that the government allows you to protect as a property interest and you would register your trademark with the government, you would um, apply for a patent for your invention, and you would um, uh, get a copyright for your original authorship of your work. Great. As you're talking, it, it occurs to me, I know stories of every single one of those categories in the world of small business. You know, small business for, for our purposes is 500 employees or less. So it's actually pretty big business if you're looking at who employs who in the state of Michigan, right? So I know of, I know of a company that extremely successful, high profile storefront in, in, in a big successful mall area, end cap, franchising out, copyright infringement on a name. Is that right? Is that copyright? That's, yeah. No, that would be trademark. Okay, trademark. Yes. So they had to change tens of thousands of dollars. We're talking about building signage, every piece of marketing. This is, and then 
also franchise owners had to do the same thing, right? So it's, it can be a big, a big debacle if you do it wrong. What are some other, some like copyright? Give us an example of. Well, the um, copyright would be uh, a book. So the, a novel written by James Patterson, he would copyright that. You couldn't use that novel and, and say it was yours. Um, music, we've all heard of the, um, the um, infringement cases uh, against like Blurred Lines, for instance, uh, the, the song. That's very common in the music industry because- Ghostbusters is my era. I think that <laughs> if, Ray Parker Jr. Sure, <laughs> if 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 that work is copyrighted and that um, that that music, it someone tries to use it in their own and say it's their own, then um, they can bring a suit. So it's very yeah. common, and that would be copyright. Interesting. Okay, so what would a business owner want to know about intellectual property? Well, what um, I would think that business owners would want to know is first of all that a domain name, which would be your website, that's not intellectual property. Um, also, if you register your company name with the state of Michigan, for instance, that's not intellectual property. What is intellectual property would be your, the name of your company if you used it to identify either your product or your services that you offer. Um, or a logo or something that you use, again, with your products or services. Um, and in order to get that brand name copyright or trademarked, it has to be unique and it can't be confusingly similar to any other type of name or trademark. Um, for patents, if you have uh, something you think is an invention, the most important thing that people aren't aware of is do not share that. Don't put it out into the public domain. Because once you do that with a patent, then you, um, it precludes you from actually getting a patent for it. Because it's already in the public domain, you don't have anything to protect. So keep it to yourself and then apply for your patent. What happens, Denise, if you are a business and you want to expand beyond the borders of Michigan? Does that have any effect for people who are expanding? Absolutely. Um, I think as Jackie uh, mentioned, the first thing that business owners need to remember, because a lot of business owners make their own businesses, is that your registration with the state of Michigan, so just registering your name to become a business, is not trademark protection in any way. Okay, and people think it is. Now it's good um, evidence of common law use. It's a good evidence that you're intending to use that name, but it's not enough. So for example, when I was previously general counsel for Child Time Learning Centers, uh, it was an Illinois company practicing in Michigan. My first job, because they wanted to go national, was to go all around the, the nation and buy the name Child Time from other states. Uh, other people in other states were using that name. So what you need to know if you're going to go outside of Michigan, particularly, and start um, marketing or selling a product out of state is that you need to be aware that if somebody else is using the same name, okay, or a confusingly similar logo in another state, they have first use. So the first thing you need to do is do some due diligence. Find out how common your name really is before you put tens of thousands of dollars into marketing it and franchising. And the very next thing you need to do after you've chosen a name that you think is unique and represents your business is protect it. You need to register it with the USPTO, which is the United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.gov. You can start doing your own searches, but I really recommend, especially if you're going outside of Michigan, that you hire a, a qualified intellectual property attorney to do that search for you to make sure that you're not going to start marketing in a state where that name's already being used. And then you, you, know, you lose your right to use that name in that state. So if your intent in, in this day and age, I think we're all trying to market out of state at some point. Inter, you know, um, the internet has given us the ability to reach a much broader audience than we used to be able to. So it's, it's much more important. Uh, it really is. I think that's a, that's a really important <clears throat> segue into the, the digital world. Because we, you know, as I, I own a marketing company, mm -hmm. and we have seen all kinds of just walking up to that line and even crossing that line, uh, cases where we are working with a client who might have used a photo, mm -hmm. not gotten credit. We had a situation where they used it, they were contacted by a photographer and said, this is my photo, and you have to pay me to use this. You got this from a site and didn't pay for it. Uh, in that case, it was very 
amicable. Uh, we we settled on a fair amount of money, paid that money, and then used that photo. It's not always amicable though. And when you look at how folks are using things in digital marketing, uh, there are times when it's okay. If you're a person who wants to put a meme out there, there are images that you can use for free and you can put your funny little meme, um, I'm having a bad day and show uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. But then there are other times when you're trying to use something funny and represent a business and you're gonna make money off of it. SpongeBob, not so happy about that, right? So there's a lot of a lot of blurred lines there, and we actually got a cease and assist letter. So I, I like, what do you do when you get that? Yeah, those are those are the worst. You know, a little chill goes down your spine. Um, they're a warning shot, though. Okay, so a cease and desist letter is just another company's na uh, version of telling you to stop what you're doing. They think they might not, though. They think that they own some intellectual property right that you're infringing on. So they think that they own a name and that you're using that name or that photo or that image or that invention or whatever um, without their authorization. The first thing you need to do is not handle it yourself. This is one of those areas, and I know we're all sm small business owners, so we all wear so many hats. I think that this is one of those circumstances where you need to lawyer up immediately because the way that you handle it, you handled it appropriately, but the way you handle that is very important going forward. Uh, you need to also do your due diligence and make sure that that company actually owns that intellectual property. Um, I think that we've all experienced the case where people squat on domain names. So they'll go get a bunch of domain names and try to get you to pay money to get that domain name. And, and they can do that, but that does not give them intellectual property rights to that name. So they can't prevent you from using your name okay, just because they own the domain name. Well, that actually so, happened to me. Correct. Yeah, we wanted to use uh, <clears throat> inverve.com. Right. We had to go with invervemarketing.com because we couldn't buy the name. And they keep upping the domain, <laughs> you know, they keep re-registering it <clears throat> as their own. And so sure. we, have to, we have to live with it. You know? So one of the things that you can do when you're getting a dona domain name is that you can register different versions of it, you know, several different versions, and also your, your name that you're registering with your state to conduct your business. You can do different types of that name and different versions of that name to make sure that nobody does something just slightly different than yours and then starts co-opting your name. The other thing you need to do when you get a cease and desist letter is to talk to the people. You need to know what they want. They either want to just stop you from using it because it may be sort of a first instance in your foray out into the world with that name and you need to just get a different name or they might be unreasonable, you don't know. They might be uh, telling you that you're using their name but you could be a different industry altogether. So you're right, there are a lot of nuances to the law. For example, you can use a lot of what is usually protected intellectual property as long as you're using it for educational purposes but then when you go to use it to make money, that's when you start crossing the line because that's their right. Their right is to make that money off of that name. There's also something called a parody. You're saying memes and stuff like that. Uh, if you're making fun of something or if you're satirizing it for uh, commentary purposes, that's fine, you can do that. Once you start making money off of it though, this is when people start to get a little cranky. So you need to figure out what they want and then see if you can come to a resolution. So that's interesting. You're talking about putting stuff out there digitally. It's so easy to just sure. push things out into the world now. I do a lot of speaking all over and um, I'll put my presentations out there. Does that mean somebody can own my presentation? How does that work? Well, um, Lisa, if you are putting something out on the internet, people have to be um, aware of if they're using something that they've um, gotten from the internet, such as your presentation, they have to look for whether it's copyrighted or not. And you should see somewhere on the website where it might say protected um, copyright or, or a statement um, of restricted use. The other thing to, to really for people if you're going to be downloading something from the internet and using it is to look for things in the public domain. Those are things that are not copyrighted. And those you can freely use. They're in the public domain. Um, the best practice would be if someone's downloading from something from the internet to use is to um, either use things in the public domain 
or get um, the permission of the author of that um, work. Because when we're talking about things on the internet, we're mostly talking about copyrighted works. It would be uh, something written or a photo, that kind of thing. There's something called the fair use doctrine, which allows the use of a very small amount, uh, percentage of the entire work, but it's hard to gauge what that small percentage is. So it's better just to get permission or to use something in the public domain. And I think as a business owner, you have to be, so I'm keenly aware of the marketing space and probably more so than anything. Uh, what we see so often is you've got a college intern doing your social media. You've got a college intern updating your website or maybe not even a college, maybe you know your, your cousin who, who just has some little bit of writing chops. And they may unknowingly infringe on somebody else's intellectual property. Are you still liable for that? Certainly, yes. I mean, you need to get, as you found out, um, you need to get permission. And it's just as easy as asking the, the author, can you use it? Um, and if you do get the letter, the cease and desist letter, as Denise mentioned and as you mentioned, respond to it. What do they want? Um, if you've just used a photo and you've done it accidentally, you know, that's, that's different from someone who may be using a large amount of someone's work and intentionally using it uh, to make a profit. Okay, so you guys, we have to just bring this up. You guys are experts in the cannabis business. That's been an interesting thing to watch. People rush, it's like a whole new industry emerging like a tidal wave. And, and so um, what's going on there? Are they having trouble with intellectual property as, as this just explosion in that industry happens? So the trouble that they're having isn't maybe what everyone would think. Um, we, of course, marijuana, even though it's legal in Michigan now, is still federally illegal. So for a long time, um, quasi-businesses or businesses or people making products that with a certain name have been afraid of registering those names at the federal level with the USPTO for fear of discovery, retribution, prosecution, you name it. So they've they haven't been registering those names. And of course, you cannot register uh, a name for the sale of marijuana products at the federal level. So there are ways that you can register names, though, because we still have the First Amendment. So you can register anything. You can register a cannabis leaf. You can register um, you know, rainbow and marijuana and all that, uh, and all of the names associated with marijuana. Uh, you just have to do it on things like apparel or glassware or paper products. The problem is that because this industry has been so robust for such a long time, but not legal until really right now, you have a lot of trade names that sound exactly the same. You know, green, alternative, meds, um, you know, anything dank, anything 420, 420, good grief. I don't think that 420 is even protectable anymore because it's so commonly used. So when you get that I'm many sorry, people, I don't know what 420 I'm sorry. is. Can you, I, so, I'm a, I'm so a little old-fashioned and conservative. So. It's sort of a code name for marijuana. It started a long time ago with a couple of students in California meeting after class to smoke marijuana. And their class ended at 420. And they met at 420 in the afternoon every day. And so 420 has sort of become a, a, a common shorthand name for, you know, smoking marijuana. Go it's meeting up and... Sure. So 420 right. is just one of those. And, you know, people will say now, happy 420. So April 20th is now a, a marijuana holiday. So sorry about that. It's, you know, <laughs> we've been in this for so long that this is just nomenclature for us anymore. I don't think about it. So, um, but now that marijuana is becoming more mainstream and it's now gone from somewhat illegal business or underground to a significantly you know, more profitable, much more legal, highly regulated space where you've got big investors and big companies coming in, you see that people are starting to protect their intellectual property. And there are going to be a lot of cease and desist letters going back and forth in this industry pretty soon because the way that you market a product, of course, is the trademark and the logo. And the way that you get known is your name. And we've got a lot of green this and acres this and, and 420 that, and they all sound the same right now, and they all have eerily similar logos, so uh, it ought to get pretty interesting, but 
at least we're, we're fighting over the right things now, which is intellectual property. So, How much difference can you get if you've got a, a brand name or a name that's, that's firmly owned by someone else? Can you just capitalize a letter in the middle? Can you just put a K instead of a C? How, how far do you have to go to make it your own? So Jackie may want to take this. I don't know. You just can't be confusing. You can't be confusing to the consumer. That's sort of the standard for intellectual property. How, who gets to decide? Well, the, the courts eventually, OK? But uh, you know, so there's like McDonald's, the Golden Arches. You could open a shoe store called McDonald's Shoes. But you can't open a hamburger place or a restaurant called McDonald's now. Got right? it. So it can't okay. be confusing to the consumer. Well, this was really, really fascinating and fun to have you here. I appreciate it. And uh, I think we need another show on cannabis. That just sounds like where we're going here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Jeff, today on the show, we've been focusing on the really fun side of intellectual property, the legal side. So there's also a side that's not all about attorneys and forms and regulations. There's just intellectual property. Right, so um, think about the intellectual property that's in every employee's head, the processes that they use, the uh, tools that they use, the passwords that they use, uh, their, the, how they get things done. That's all intellectual property as well because it's in their head, right? And if that property or if that information is not written down somewhere, if it's not in a, pro a written process, if it's not uh, communicated to the organization, if the organization doesn't have any control over it, then what happens when that employee walks out the door? Now, we see this a lot because there's low unemployment and there's a lot of job turnover and things like that. So from a small business perspective, if they don't control these things, they're going to lose because that intellectual property is walking out the door. So we need to control it. We need to have things written down. I know it's small for a hard business to, to deal with that, but they need someone to pull information out of people's heads and get it on paper and get it in a system that's secure. They need passwords. They need control of passwords. If, I'm, if I create my own uh, thing on HubSpot, for example, and I'm doing the work for the business and I'm using HubSpot and I leave, now, who's got the control of HubSpot? Nobody. I have it, and that's intellectual property that walked out the door. So uh, small business owners need to really think about all the aspects of this, the practical aspects, not the legal aspects. Get their house in order, make sure that they document and that they control because it's theirs. They paid for it. They paid for the creation of this content. They need to control it and keep it. Thank you. Focus on Tech, brought to you by Providence, making technology easier. Dave, we're talking about intellectual property today. What kinds of things should business owners be aware of that you could talk about? You know, a few years ago, Michigan had a uh, bunch of incidents where some unscrupulous uh, individuals would try to walk up to a business and say, you know that cop machine you got there in the corner? I actually own the patent to the way that your computer talks to that. And, you know, you don't have a license, so you owe me $2,500. A lot of small businesses don't have their own patent attorneys on, on staff or whatever. Uh, and so they just coughed up the, the $2,500 because, well, okay, it looks like this is legit. But in actuality, the person who walked in didn't even have access to the patent. They just kind of made it up. Or the patent had expired or something along those lines. They're called patent trolls. And that can really be a, um, a painful experience, particularly for small business people. So. Um, I was fortunate to work with a former senator, uh, Margaret O'Brien. We came up with the Bad Faith uh, Patent Claim Infringement Act, which basically would say, if you don't have access to a patent, you don't own the patent, uh, 
you're breaking the law in Michigan, and it gives the uh, attorney general the, the ability to go after that person to get them to cease and desist. It also requires when there is a legitimate claim uh, that there are certain information that has to be given to the person as they're having that, confirmation, that, uh, that conversation. Uh, for example, what's the patent number that, I'm, that I allege that you violated? What, uh, where can you contact me? Uh, what's the name of the patent owner? And tell me exactly how you infringed against, uh, against the patent. Um, um, just things that, that will help you either defend the case or just explain, okay, I didn't realize I had infringed that patent. But in the long run, definitely will save some, some time, money, and, and energy for, for those small business owners. Who knew? What an interesting new scam I'm hearing about today. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Glad to do it. Thank you. Focus on Banking, brought to you by Michigan Bankers Association. Denise, what if a business has been operating for some time mm -hmm. and has not yet filed to protect its name and logo? Sure. So don't panic. But um, I think that it's natural after you've been in business a while and you have your name in your local community, you think, well, why would anyone else use my name? But it's a big state. It's a big country. And we have internet uh, commerce now. So it is wise to make sure that um, you start protecting it as soon as possible. If you haven't protected it, if you haven't registered it, it does not mean that you don't have any intellectual property rights. Uh, the first rule of protecting your trademark and your name is use it. Use it all over the place, use it a lot, and the more that you saturate your particular market with your name, the more it's protected, actually. So at that point, you would want to contact uh, an intellectual property attorney, a trademark attorney, have them do a search for you, and go ahead and register it and see what happens. It doesn't mean that somebody else is, is already using it. Just get to it as soon as you can. Nice. So what happens uh, when a business owner gets a letter saying they're infringing on someone else's intellectual property? Right. So um, this happens a lot. Um, as, as much as we like to think that we all have a great original idea, um, names are names, and um, especially if it's in a, it's uh, from the same industry that you're in, uh, you need to be wary of that. Doesn't mean they're right, okay? A lot of people send demand letters and they're not right. Uh, they could just be aggressive, but that's time to get an attorney. That demand letter does not mean that you're in for court uh, and it doesn't mean you necessarily have to stop using your name, but you do need to find out. Um, there's a difference between using a name in the same industry and using a name in a, in a different industry. So you can use the same name. You can have McDonald's hamburgers and McDonald's shoe store. And because that's not confusing to any consumer, right? Nobody's going to walk into a shoe store expecting hamburger. If, if it's not confusing to a consumer, right, then you're not really infringing on their trade name or their logo. So it's just worth finding out, and it's not something that you can't pay attention to. Obviously, you need to deal with it. Focus on Law, brought to you by Policella and Associates, PLLC. The very words intellectual property lead you down the right path. Use your intellect, be smart about it. Do a little research, make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row before you tackle this really important business term. Have a great day, we'll see you next week.